Okay. Um, hi, I'm Aria Dean. Um, I'm an artist, writer, and curator based in New York. Um, and thank you for having me here today. Um, yeah, so I, yeah, I'm an artist, I'm a writer, um, I'm also, my, specifically, I'm a curator at this organization called Rhizome, it's based at the New Museum in New York, um, and our focus is on art and technology, specifically on um, net art and digital culture, um, and I've been there for a few years, and yeah, the work that I do there intersects with, I guess with the work that I do as an artist and writer, and so this talk kind of sits at the intersection of all three of those modes of working for me. Um, but broadly speaking, just some background on me. Um, in my practice, I'm particularly interested in, um, I guess, race and technology, or I have been, and I'm, maybe I'm moving out of that specifically, um, like recently more and more. But um, I think what I've been particularly interested in is linking the concerns um, exhibited by a lot of black artists, specifically in America, um, with concerns that have characterized um, technological histories and media theories in the like later 20th and into the 21st century. Um, so yeah, so sort of in investigating um, black artists' work, black, black theorists' work, um, not just for themselves, although I'm very interested in what those things mean for black communities in particular and for um, black studies in particular, but also sort of seeing the um, work that they've done in a sort of, uh, to sort of workshop certain ideas often before they've reached um, a larger Western philosophical conversation. Um, so sort of as a, I guess the idiom would be the canary in a coal mine in some sense, um, black studies, black artists often act as one. Um, yeah, so this particular talk um, builds on a previous one that I gave, I guess like maybe two years ago um, via Skype um, for a school in Portland, Oregon in the States. Um, and that talk turned into an essay um, that was published in EFLUX called Notes on Black Acceleration last winter, I believe. Um, and so this talk I've sort of titled Notes on Black Acceleration 2, though it's kind of still, it's very much like a revisitation of that text and um, an expansion in certain places and sort of trying to think through what it means for me personally, but also just, I guess, like, in the time since it's been written, sort of the ways I've seen it taken up um, and what I'm interested in still in relationship to it. Um, yeah, so it's gonna, if you've read the EFLUX essay, it might cover some territory that you've already heard, but kind of going back over it um, for those who don't know about it or for myself as well. Um, and I think that also this is part of a larger project for myself that maybe, maybe mainly manifests in my artistic practice, um, which I mean, this, I think this is sort of operates as a frame for my artistic practice in the sense that um, I'm very interested in alternative subject formations and looking into the ways that um, subjects, particularly, I guess, myself in a way, um, interact with other subjects and the way that objects, particularly artworks, um, can mediate that and sort of creating artworks that workshop different sort of um, subject interactions and, and sort of, yeah, in, investigate the things that I've written about um, over the last few years. And so yeah, so in that sense, this project I think is a bit of like an effort in, in forensics to sort of explore this question of um, blackness and accelerationism and the relationship between the two. Um, but it's also a close reading and a prehistory and sort of theory fiction in some ways as well. Um, yeah, and I think that also, so yeah, in terms of my practice, I think that Again, yeah, I'm specifically interested in black artists, black histories in some ways, but I'm also interested in various histories and theories of anti-humanism, um, both from a sort of speculative post-humanist technological perspective, but also looking at um, things that we find, again, in black studies, in media and film theory, even going back to the 1970s, um, and then also in sort of general post-structuralist frameworks as well. And so I sort of consider these um, parallel and intersecting inquiries. Um, and sometimes I think that, and especially with this essay and this talk, they're sort of, it's sort of um, forcing together things that maybe aren't necessarily meant to be thought together and sort of seeing what happens and sort of experimenting with, um, yeah, placing things in proximity that sort of maybe in their historical positioning aren't like quote unquote meant to be put together. Um, for instance, like Nick Land and Black Studies or something like that. Um, so yeah, so to get started. Um, okay, so yeah, I guess one question 
and sort of approaching this now is why accelerationism. Um, of course, if you're not familiar, though it probably many of you are, um, in short, accelerationism is this concept that the only way out of capitalism is through it. That's in the very short uh, version of it. Um, and this position has, I guess, been considered a bit passe in the United States of late. Um, it was really popular and a hot topic for a while, um, but I mean, there are probably a number of different reasons you could offer for why it's not as popular as it used to be, but I think probably some of it has to do with the political situation in the U.S., um, and then as well in England where a lot of the, the theorists were workshopping these ideas even going further back. Um, and so I think that it, I don't know, as a sort of anti-capitalist theory, it doesn't seem particularly um, in vogue at the moment, but I think for me personally, I was interested in writing this essay and, and continuing the sort of thinking various iterations of this talk. Because for me personally, my own development, um, a lot of those thinkers were really pivotal. Um, like when I was in university, my, when I was, you know, my early days of university, I stumbled across Mark Fisher's writings and probably before I'd read a lot of the stuff that one should read before entering at that point. Um, and as likewise with Nick Land. And so, I think that for me, I've always kind of had this, vested, this investment in these conversations and became very interested in why they'd fallen by the wayside or what the things were that I felt like they weren't um, able to encompass or, yeah, what their failures had been. Um, so yeah, so in some ways it tries to reckon with what happened um, and also to inject some life back into that conversation. Um, and yeah, in my view, I think that accelerationism for a variety of reasons is a sort of redeemable thought position, um, or at the very least one that requires further examination and expansion. Um, and so yeah, so in particular for me, uh, this redemption or a sort of foundational revision that I wanted to make in the process of writing this um, is to revise the history of capital that accelerationism relies on, which is currently a fairly traditional Marxist model, you know, alienation from one's labor, wage theft, et cetera, um, to incorporate instead the concept of racial capitalism um, grounded in this idea that capital was kickstarted by the rape of the African continent in a lot of ways and um, sort of really taking as a cornerstone of, the theory, of a possible acceleration, accelerationist position that the relations present in chattel slavery um, and not simply the alienation of workers from, the la from their labor is actually core to our understanding of capital. And I want to clarify also that this position is, I don't view it as just a failure to theorize responsibly towards minority groups and you know, incorporate a diversity of perspectives, but rather as a holistic failure to understand capitalism as we know it. Um, and this is also a failure that afflicts many different approaches to the subject of capital. Um, and so yeah, okay. So, oh yeah, so these are just two, these, yeah, that's the quote from Nick Land, and then um, this one from Robin McKay and Armin Avanesian. Um, which is, if, if at its most radical, accelerationism claims in Kamat's words that there can be revolution that is not for the human and draws the consequences of this, then one can either take the side of an inherited image of the human against the universal history of capital and dream of leaving this world, or one can accept that the means of production are going for revolution of their own. And then... Okay. And then this other one, um, you get this sense that most African Americans owe nothing to the status of the human. Okay. So um, yeah, so this whole project is not necessarily a unified theory of black accelerationism as I've sort of termed it, um, as a sort of portmanteau of blackness and, or black and accelerationism. Um, and it's not a black accelerationism, as in a black perspective on accelerationism, and it's not a critique of accelerationism from the position of blackness or black studies. Um, the idea that I wanted to put forward here is that blackness and accelerationism share a number of concerns. Um, both are occupied with the future or a lack thereof, with the end of the world, with the logic and tendencies of capital, and both are locked in a struggle with humanism. Um, black accelerationism as an alternative to the split between, or black acceleration I view as an alternative to the split between left and right accelerationisms that emerged over the course of the development of that, the, ser the sort of um, thread of thinking. So to consider all of this, I sort of, we kind of have to go back to the beginning and I'll run through this sort of brief history without dragging through every sort of direction of it. Um, but accelerationist thought traces its lineage to Marx himself, bouncing around a number of 19th and 20th century thinkers along the way. 
In the late 1990s, a group called CCRU, which was mentioned, I believe, in the last presentation, um, based at Warwick University, played a major role in the development of accelerationist theories. The group included Nick Land, Mark Fisher, Sadie Plant, and Kodwa Shun, all of whom made major contributions to the theory and have also had major influence via their own work across political, aesthetic, and media theories. Um, the CCRU's work and other threads around the millennium eventually give way to an ideological split in the field which has been very simplistically, but aptly for the most part, configured as left versus right accelerationism. So on the right, um, Nick Land, who has become sort of the grandfather of right accelerationism, um, and over time has increasingly become associated with neo-reactionary extremist right-wing thought, um, sort of in the style of Mencius Moldbug, who is this online blogger, um, very well, very influential on the American alt-right, so hence the Make America Great Again um, hat. Um, but yeah, so Land was very involved in the CCRU and in sort of the workshopping of this theory of accelerationism. And so just to quote Land himself, um, he writes that there's no distinction to be made between the destruction of capitalism and its intensification. The auto-destruction of capitalism is what capitalism is. Creative destruction is the whole of it, besides only its retardations, partial compensations, or inhibitions. Capital revolutionizes itself more thoroughly than any extrinsic revolution possibly could. If subsequent history has not vindicated this point beyond all question, it has at least simulated such vindication to a maddening degree. So it's important, I think, to me in the process of thinking all this through and in, in terms of like Land's legacy beyond just becoming a neo-reactionary, xenophobic um, monster philosopher of sorts, um, is that he characterizes capital as a sort of willing and independent entity, something with its own desires and operations beyond our agency. Um, and this part of the theory does hold water. I think that's like pretty demonstrably true in you know, global experiences of capital. Um, capital has ability to revolutionize and to recuperate, um, to recuperate especially um, dissenting positions, um, anti-capitalist action, et cetera. Um, and it clearly has taken over most sectors of life. Um, so Fisher's question again, is there no alternative? Um, you know, remains a question that we have to we have to grapple with. Is there any alternative, or is there even any outside to capitalism? Um, yeah. So then, on the left, sort of after Nuland has workshopped this version of things, um, yeah, left accelerationism in the wake of that has restaged Landian nihilism as a sort of comedic, like urban romance with technology. Um, so Nick Turnchek and Alex Williams, who in 2013, in 2013 penned a manifesto for the accelerationist politics, they, and then ended up writing this book, Inventing the Future, um, they sort of take this position that, and builds on, building on Land's position, but um, they take the position that says that if we accelerate technology, we can reach a sort of post-capitalist future, um, where we can appropriate capitalist modes to a better end, and they're very, very into this idea that automation is the way forward. Somehow this automation will just sort of lead to an uncomplicated and revolutionary class consciousness um, that is entirely scalable, and we can reach, yeah, a new, like, utopian um, society. Um, and so this left accelerationism, is waterlogged by a duty to grapple with identity politics, labor, and practicality. Well-meaning Cernitick and Williams are consumed with searching for a subject who can contend with the immeasurably vast and powerful forces of capital. This seems to be a knee-jerk obligatory reaction against Land's callous and aggressive inhumanism. They are troubled by the fact that Land's account of capital's acceleration is also an account of inev inevitable human obsolescence. What good is a revolution if we're counted among its casualties? And is this even accelerationist anymore? Kind of, it's kind of, in the end also, like yeah, in their book, it's kind of just an old school Marxist position with a sort of like shiny chrome paint job. So basically what you end up with between the two of these, the right and the left of accelerationism, on the right you have Nick Land's inhuman fatalistic madness, which of course now in 2019 has been wholly tainted by his xenophobia and right extremism. And then on the left you sort of have Nick, have Cernicek and Williams subject-centered, admirable but, but conservative approach. And I sort of have evaluated personally, and I, mean, I think there are other ways to look at this, but um, at the bottom of the gulf between them kind of lies this question of the human. Uh, we'll stay here. Um, yeah, so I became interested in, in the process of like revisiting and, and thinking more about, I don't even remember exactly why I got to the point where I was like, oh, I'd really like to look back at the beginnings of this, um, like these, this sort of argument between the right and the left and try to figure out what happened. But, I became interested in retracing the search for the accelerationist subject, kind of wondering how did we get from 
you know, pre lands fall from grace in some ways? How did we get from the sort of inhumanism of his approach to this very, very humanistic um, sort of like, yeah, like very practically political um, project that Williams and Cerner Czech put forth. So yeah, so I, I went back and I pieced together, or I sort of started investigating all these like old blog posts from around 2008, because um, like, a lot of these ideas were getting, yeah, just like everyone had their like personal blog and, and would post their little theories of capital or whatever on these blogs. And so I pieced together a series of exchanges um, in blog archives between Mark Fisher and Alex Williams. Um, so in October of 2008, Alex Williams published a blog post called Xeno Economics and Capital Unbound on his blog Splintering Bone Ashes. Written, oh no. <laughs> okay. Okay, written during the peak of the financial crisis, the post finds Williams asking how the crisis might be hidden, a hidden opportunity. He writes, perhaps what this crash offers, however, is a chink in the armor of late capital, a Bedouin event evading the usual insituational structural determinations. In order that the potential of this event offers to be fully exploited, we need a politics capable of fully evading even the kind of generic humanism Badu's politics, for example, proffers. For the impasse of the end of history can only be properly surmounted by a final nihilistic overcoming of humanism. In a sense, even Badu fails this, this test, his minimal communist humanism not going far enough. What perhaps this might entail is a rethinking of a revolutionary position built on the basis of a rethinking of the very notion of value itself. Um, and he goes on and later in the post to talk about how sort of again thinking about capitalism as this like free willing entity unto itself. Um, he writes that capitalist and capital intersects with us. It has us as moving parts, but it ultimately is not of or for us. It is an alien life form. And he then calls for xeno economics, which would take into all this into account in formulating a totally new theory of value that thinks, thinks of capitalism outside of alienation. It'll be a theory of value, he says, that is not predicated upon this original suffering, the voodoo process of soul theft at the core of, of the alienation of labor in the commodity form. Oh, okay, sorry, I didn't, I didn't go to the next thing, sorry. Um, this was the first quote that I read, but I don't know if you got it, yeah. Okay, and so then he also says that as the way of, out of the binaries of, le of leftism, which is an utterly and irritably moribund, and any liberal economics, which is ideologically bankrupt, we must bend both together in the face of an inhuman and indefatigable capitalism to think how we might inculcate a new form of radically inhuman subjectiv subjectivation. This entails the retrieval of the communist project for a new man and the liberation of the neoliberal quest for a capitalism unbound, for both its subterranean dependence upon the state and the skeletal humanist discursive a priori which animates its ideological forms. Okay, oh, sorry, long block quotes. Um, yeah, so basically, in, I mean, this, his posts are sort of like overly articulated in some ways, but the two things that he sort of appears to be looking for are one, capitalism without alienation, and two, a new and human subject as a sort of um, counter to, or sort of to find an alternative, a second way out of, um, second way through an accelerationist thought that would be beyond and outside of Nick Land's kind of view. So yeah, basically asking this question, what kind of subject can possibly participate in the demise of this alien machine we call capitalism? How, and then, Again, how do we do this without following Nick Land down this rabbit hole that he's gone down? Um, so Mark Fisher then writes back and poses this problem of agency. And he says, so that's not one, sorry. So then he says, let's suppose that such a thing could emerge from the husk of late capitalism. One major difference between splintering Bo Nash's accelerationism and Landianism is over the question of agency. For Landianism, capital is the only agent of note, whereas for splintering Bo Nash's, capital must be assisted to become something else. But what form would this assistance take? What group subject could emerge which would be both willing and able to offer it? In the lack of a collective agent, wouldn't we be back to a kind of theoretical parlor game that has no consequences? And so he's really considering this also in sort of in the wake of the demise of a lot of different workers' movements, because of course, like a lot of, you know, many of the theories of group subjectivities or group subject that we have rely on this sort of like workerism or yeah, like the class consciousness um, built, on, built by sort of worker subjectivity. Um, He's sort of asking, I guess, like sort of after neoliberalism, how can we formulate a group subject? And is there one that exists that could possibly even want to or be able to contend with capital? 
And so then Williams writes back with a definition of strong versus weak acceleration of centauri. This is like very like granular back and forths, but it's kind of useful for this for the project in a sense. Um, but so Williams writes back with a definition of strong versus weak accelerationisms, which seems to try to circumvent this problem, and then also lays the groundwork for his later what we would end up terming weak accelerationist project, um, which is laid out in Inventing the Future. So he writes that weak accelerationism chiefly seeks to invigorate an anti-ameliorative left politic. On the other hand, strong accelerationism maintains that acceleration, accelerationism doesn't just open Pandora's box, creating conditions for revolution in familiar form, but instead strong accelerationism might be the process necessary to erase the human altogether as a form of subjectivation and to actualize something close to the dissolution of subjectivity. And so Fisher writes back promptly, gently reiterating his concerns about jettisoning the necessar necessarily totalizing inhumanness at the center of land. And he asks, what would it mean to reconfigure this picture so that human agency plays a role? Would this make any sense at all? Who, if anyone, is in the driver's seat? And who are the members of the party of inhuman negativity, as he terms it? So yeah, again, so I became interested in these two things that William's early search for left accelerationism hinges on, and this back and forth between the two of them. And the first, yeah, so the first of these two things is capitalism without alienation, and the second is a new and human subject. And essentially, so sort of after rereading all of this stuff and thinking about it alongside the readings I've been doing and the work that I've been doing in my writing around black studies and technology, um, I guess I got interested in this idea that like there's a long history in black radical thought around sort of thinking through the problem of the human as it relates to blackness. Um, and I sort of thought, well, you know, like there have been a lot of complaints about accelerationism's sort of, you know, white maleness in certain ways and um, its sort of narrow view or like a yeah, narrow sort of range of thinking. And I wondered like what would happen if you sort of cross-pollinated the perspectives of black radical thought and mostly from sort of American thinkers, although there are some thinkers from like Caribbean and Africa as well who participate in this. But um, what if you cross-pollinated these two? And what I sort of came to from that was that it's really this question, this ostensible newness attributed to this subject, this new inhuman subject that has impeded the left accelerationist project. Um, this mode for a radically inhuman, inhuman subjectivation um, and with it a corresponding understanding of capital outside of alienation already exists and has for some time. And that if you follow in the thinking of a lot of black radical thinkers, that subjectivity could be found in the black non-subject as it emerges in the history of capitalism when you view capitalism as nothing other than racial capitalism. Um, yeah, so racial capitalism. So Cedric Robinson, who wrote Black Marxism, um, is sort of the arbiter of this term racial capitalism. Um, it's a great book, Black Marxism, if you're interested in general histories of capital, but also um, colonial and yeah, racialized histories. Um, but Black Marxism traces the emergence of capitalism um, and writes its history into the 20th century making major interventions. Um, and this major intervention is that he writes that capitalism on both sides of the Atlantic econom or is economically undergirded by processes of racialization. And importantly, um, is undergirded by African slave labor. Um, so it, African slave labor becomes a fundamental cornerstone, not just in that um, various economies depended on the unwaged labor of African slaves, but also that the logics of capital are built on that relation um, and not simply upon, of course, as many sort of history's capital have taught us, um, not simply on wage theft. Um, other thinkers also build onto this theory. Um, there's Frank Wilderson, who wrote this book, or this uh, essay, Whether the Slave Gramsci's Black Marx, um, in which he suggests that capital's origins are, and sort of, yeah, building on Robinson, um, writes that capital's origins are rooted in approaching a particular body, a black body, with direct relations of force, not by approaching a white body with variable capital. Um, and he's the person who sort of very pithily remarks that uh, capital was kickstarted by the rape of the Afri African continent. Um, and yeah, so he elaborates on Robinson's position, as does um, Hortense Spillers, Sadia Hartman, um, various other primarily black American philosophers and writers. Um, but they, yeah, they all basically propose through this idea of racial capitalism that there is an unthought position beyond the worker, that of the slave, that is crucial to the construction of civil society and to the drama of value in the first place in the West. And that any analysis of capital that does not begin here makes a fatal mistake. And so these theories of racial, these theories and histories of racial capitalism provide an in-depth account of capitalism and value beyond alienation as Williams hopes to find it. Again, 
um, in that they're based in this sort of um, the slave relation rather than this worker workers alienation relation. And they also provide an account of an ex existent inhuman subjectivity, um, which is the black, a subjectivity formed around in response to and in excess of a legal and social cultural lack of access to humanity. And this is evidenced um, sort of practically speaking in things like uh, in America, the three fifths law, which is like after slavery, um, a given black person was counted as three fifths of an actual um, full human being, um, or even through technologies um, like optical camera technologies that actually have an inability to see black people sort of all these things that kind of stem from what sort of uh, in its most innocuous form would be known as like white centrality, but um, yeah, in a sort of philosophical form might be, yeah, the sort of generalized inhuman inhumanity of blackness. Um, and it also has engendered a sort of subjectivity or ontology formed in a very peculiar relation to capital itself. So under racial capitalism, from the middle passage onward, um, the was African made black, of course, because the category of blackness only exists post middle passage. Um, it's a miraculous paradox in a sense, human but not a unique subject object, a labor commodity, both productive labor and value, a quantitative, quantitative abstraction of exchange, um, the equivalent again of three fifths of a single unit of representational value. The value of black individual is not simply in the physical body itself, but in the energy the potential force the body contain. So it sort of becomes this question of, or sort of, yeah, the subjectivity of black individuals post slave trade is this sort of strange, again, paradox between being both commodity, both um, like subject and commodity, both object and subject, and, and particularly also being the potential force the body contained, um, being potential value, being speculative value. And um, so, yeah, so what are we to make of a person who is a commodity or thing, or commodity thing of subjects who are not workers, whose labor is exploited and converted into capital, um, but who are capital themselves, bought and sold on the speculative market? Um, and there's a really good book also, if you're more interested in this particular topic, by um, Ian Baucom called Spectres of the Atlantic, where he talks about how not only was there a speculative market around slave labor and black bodies, but that the slave trade and the Middle Passage actually workshopped the mechanics of financial capitalism as we know it in a sort of neoliberal era. Um, and so, yeah, so this is not to say the black subject fits neatly into the escape pod that Alex Williams sits out in his blog post that the black subject is necessarily this inhuman group subject that can go head to head with capital. But it is to suggest that this apparent coincidence of inhumanism between black studies and between accelerationism is one that I, imagine, I believe is worth exploring. Um, a very specific tradition, again, of black radical thought has long claimed the inhumanity, or we could say anti-humanism, of blackness as, fundamental and, as a fundamental and decisive feature and philosophically part of blackness's gift to the world. It is to say there might be a worthy series of thought experiments that lie in reading blackness and acceleration to get, accelerationism together. Um, the philosopher Fred Moten has also written of blackness as simply being a force that shows us of another, another way of living on this planet, and in some ways it really is as simple as that. When it comes to debates around accelerationism, black, black, sorry, black accelerationism explores another way, guided by blackness, but neither takes the side of an inherited image of the human against the universal history of capital and dreams of leaving this world, nor does it accept that the means of production are going for revolution of their own. Rather, it takes a long view of history, wherein these positions merge in the form of, the living, of living capital, speculative value, and accumulated time stored in the bodies of black already and human non-subjects. So if, as in the quote that I showed in the beginning, Sorry. So yeah, if, uh, if Kamat claims that there can be a revolution that is not for the human, a statement that has been retroactively claimed by accelerationists, then this revolution is for the black. So black, social, black accelerationism for me has become something of a framework or perhaps weirdly opens up, up specifically another way of doing um, art history and art criticism, if not also doing politics and so I just want to talk about this. So I think it's the most useful element after writing this sort of weird, yeah, forensic history of this series of thoughts and sort of in injecting my own perspective into it. Um, I think the most useful element of all of this is sort of it's generalized militating against the idea of the human and not for any sort of sexy technological reasons or sort of queer materialist uh, Donna Haraway-esque reasons like slime old are kin, et cetera. Those, though those are very interesting and I think have um, their place in the sort of network of thoughts, um, but I think that I'm mostly interested in this idea that blackness presents, um, or that the inhumanism that blackness presents 
resonates with the necessity for a new framework with which to approach humanities operations on a whole. So the fact that there's this long history of black thinkers thinking through the idea of inhumanity and sort of living a life while also not being considered part of the quote unquote family of man, one might say, um, the fact that that exists alongside things like the sexy technological reasons that we see in like post-humanist thought um, or the queer materialist Donna Haraway, like Karen Barad reasons, um, I think there's something there and sort of signals that there might be, we might be ready if we weren't always already ready for a new way to approach things. So I think that for me, and now because also because I'm an artist and a writer, not because I'm and because I'm not a technologist or political theorist, I think that art is a really great place to workshop um, these questions, and sort of also happens to be a place where humanism reigns kind of over all other frameworks for thinking through our engagement with objects and other subjects, um, and also a place where humanism increasingly sort of sputters and fails. And so I wanted to end with this example um, um, from the Whitney Biennial in 2017 in the U.S., um, which sort of I think in America at least was a like not really a watershed moment, but a sort of one of a really big moment where the art world sort of reckoned with the question of blackness and the question of humanity, I suppose. Um, and I think in the process of when this all went down, I guess now yeah, it's two years ago now because the next biennial is happening now. Um, a lot of the conversations around it basically sort of relied on. Conversations around appropriation, cultural appropriation, um, and ownership, who owns an image, who gets to rep reproduce an image. And I think that it's sort of an interesting extrapolation of some of the ideas that I was trying to grapple with when I initially wrote this text, um, particularly if we wanted to like think about those two, those two you know, sort of searches, capitalism without alienation, and then um, the inhuman subjectivity thing. I think that with the Dana Schutz thing, we sort of saw people approach this work, and, and if you aren't familiar, sorry, it was um, a painting of, a painting from a photograph of Emmett Till, who was famously, he was a 15-year-old black boy in the 19, late 1950s who was famously murdered by a group of white men. Um, and famously in the US, this photo, the mother, his mother basically displayed this, or circulated the photo um, of his dead body in, or his dead mutilated body in this casket. Um, and so this white painter, Dana Schutz, painted uh, did it made a painting based on the photograph, so sort of like remediated presentation of the photograph. Um, and what I've become interested in, I think, in the aftermath of all of this, yeah, is the way that the only way to have this discussion sort of relied on the sort of classic humanistic frameworks that we usually approach art with. Um, but sort of after doing this work around this black celebrationism stuff, I started thinking, okay, what would you? How could we do this from a different perspective? One that sort of relies on again this question of. Um, capitalism without alienation and a new and human subject. And so regarding the capitalism without alienation part, um, of course, it's not necessarily a direct relation to capital, but of course it is in a way because it's an artwork and it's circulating and it's occurring value. Um, but basically, yeah, what do we do? How could we look at this from the position of, oh, and then of course also, sorry, famously this guy Parker Bright um, protested the painting wearing this shirt that says Black Death Spectacle, which I think is important as well. Um, but so how could we approach this differently? And if we approached it from this capitalism without alienation question, uh, sort of framework that um, Cedric Robinson and Frank Wilderson both sort of um, think through as well, we could sort of approach this painting from the position of dispossession. Like how could you approach this work um, from the concept that like a subject's claim to its own image is always already impossible. A subject is not alienated from its, from its image but doesn't have ownership over it at all. Um, or with uh, also considering Emmett Till's image in circulation, again, the black body being considered potential energy and value, as um, I quoted Ronald Judy earlier. So not only economic potential energy and value, but also political or semiotic energy or value. So Emmett Till's body, both in this painting and in the photograph that it was based on, existed not for itself, but as potential political energy in that it could change the tide of a conversation around race in America. And isn't he's not allowed to just be you know, the photograph does not sit on its own. Um, and then, yeah, then with this question of humanity and the inhuman subject, I guess I was interested also in how could you approach this. Um, so basically part of the dialogue around it was a lot of it relied on this question of empathy and how can we, and the, paint, the painter also expressed this desire to um, restore humanity and sort of restore justice to the family after the fact and to black people who were the subject of um, racial violence, et cetera. Um, but what would you do, how could we approach this differently that doesn't rely on, on reinserting a sense of humanity? So 
um, the painting in that sense, I think if you approach it from a sort of anti-humanist standpoint, um, becomes a sort of record of this thing that always already fails, like a double of this photographic record that's already failed to restore justice. And that, of course, after Emmett Till's death for the, you know, on and onward into, into 2019, racial violence has continued in the United States and around the world. Um, but also sort of the existence of the painting as such and of the photograph as such, um, yeah, it, it, it exists within the sort of circulation, like the force, the circulation of the violence that allows it to exist in the first place is just sort of remediated and reinforced by the work. Um, so yeah, so just an example, which I sort of got into in the, in the original text, but I guess this is all to say that I'm interested in right now in particular in taking this framework of black acceleration, which of course is like mainly interested in a sort of economic and political valence and using it to sort of approach art criticism and art history from a different lens that would sort of rely more on dispossession, circulation and social death as a framework, not only that could possibly open up looking at works by black artists, which often get you, you know, sort of talked about purely as, um, you know, uh, going up against stereotypes or restoring justice in various ways. But what if you sort of use these frameworks to open up those conversations? But then also, again, as the sort of humanist framework serves everyone less and less, um, using an anti-humanist art criticism or art, art history or art theory to open up possibilities across the board and um, sort of get, get us out of this sort of like binaristic lock that we've entered into or that we've been in for hundreds of years um, where humanism is our only recourse to talk through artworks or talk through politics. So yeah, that's it. Wouldn't a slave also be alienated? Maybe I just don't understand that concept because I think that w the worker and the slave are both alienated, or am I missing right. something? Um, well, basically, the sort of way that Wilderson talks about it is that there's not, there's no initial like ability to lay claim to ownership over one's labor that would then lead to a process of alienation from it. So there's from the so that the starting point isn't like oh yes like like you know, in a sort of pre-capitalist society where, you know, like with primitive accumulation, where it's like, oh yes, like I am, you know, um, reaping the benefits of my own labor and it's benefiting me and going back into like my own, you know, like, yeah, personal economy, whatever, that there's no, that that, that process of alienation didn't happen with, um, in the process, in when, in the process of chattel slavery, there was no, since like, African societies were operating a sort of different economic framework or whatever, that there's no process of alienation that then leads to the slave yet yeah, being, um, sort of, you know, ripped apart from the the value of their own labor, and then also the fact that, and also the fact that the being a commodity yourself and being circulated and like bought and sold as a commodity rather than, um, you know, being entering into a contract where your labor is exchanged, you know, for, you know, for capital or whatever, that that shifts the dynamic such that, yeah, again, like the process of alienation isn't there where there's like no distance between the two things. If that makes any sense. Uh, hey, thank you for your talk. Um, I wanted I wanted to to ask uh, about music because like the Kojuo quote is talking about music, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what I find really interesting about the whole like uh, about like how the CCRU were was engaging with this stuff is that it was always mediated by music. So like they did. They were reading like Robinson. Mm -hmm. They have like this collection of texts called Black Atlantis, mm -hmm. where they were connecting it a lot with uh, like the whole Drexin mm -hmm. mythos. Um, and what's really like disappointing is that uh, the theoretical part of that kind of got like left to the wayside a bit. Like really cool shit started happening with like hyperdub and stuff like that, like post CCRU work, mm -hmm. uh, like continuing from that theoretical framework. But like, I wonder with like um, the way that you're theorizing black acceleration, also the way that you're like uh, make like imbricate, imbricating it with aesthetics. Um, how does it like 
how would you like uh, address music with it? Or like, how do you think it includes music in its theorize, in your theorization of black acceleration? I'm sorry if that's mm -hmm. a bit big. No, no, that makes sense, yeah. Cool. I mean, yeah, I think that that's something that I, uh, yeah, like, felt like was a difficult, yeah, because I'm definitely like not a, enough of a music head like I feel like I don't I can't like like I've read yeah like read like Kodros like more brilliant than the sun and stuff like and I think like there's so much of this work that happens sort of with music and then have felt I've felt weird about trying to map it onto like the visual because yeah that's like what I'm primarily like interested in or whatever but I think that like I think that I would say so I mean my the closest thing I would have to an answer about it is sort of like I did this um I did this lecture, and it's a, I included some of the stuff about it in the Eflux text. But this thing about Buster Rhymes, and and that was kind of, that's kind of like the only time I've like tried to like directly talk through or think through music about it, um, and talked about his like four, um, his first four albums that are like all about the apocalypse and sort of. And I guess honestly, that's more like it's like more of a lyric thing. I've like investigated the lyrics more and like the visual. Um, components around the albums and not really like the sonic qualities of it. I think that's the thing. I, I don't think I'm particularly equipped to think, I haven't been thinking through like like the sonic qualities of music in terms of this stuff, but I think that like, I guess I'm, in some ways I've also, I've tried to like think about the stuff that they've wrote about music and then sort of try to find, I guess, visual correlates in certain ways. And that's kind of been the way that I've engaged it. And and like, cause I do think, especially with like, not that it's like a one-to-one -one relationship, but I do think that when it comes to a lot of black cultural production, the relationship between like music and the visual is like so closely tied such that it's not a like a conceptual leap or a like sort of theoretical mismatching, you know, sort of like mapping onto or something. Um, but I would like to think more about music and relationship to this stuff. And I think, and I think what you're saying is, true about the sort of theoretical elements like falling by the way I said like the Drexia stuff is so cool and then like I think there's a problem with also in popular culture with like treating anything that's um like black, any black culture production that has to do with like the future or like inhumanity and just like slapping afrofuturism on it and then like the whole like the variety of theoretical position, positions that one could investigate just become part of this like sort of cheesy like sun raw like afrofuturist thing um so I think the, I think like it'd be cool if people did a lot of work to sort of parse that out too, but yeah. Y bueno, si no, si no hay más preguntas, eh, damos la charla por cerrada y. Muchísimas gracias, Sergio. Thank you very much. Thank you.